transportation missions, um, once again launching our crews to the International Space Station and returning our crews. And then we have our Boeing uncrewed demonstration and then leading up to the Artemis I uncrewed demonstration. What is very, very clear though amongst all of us is that as we're heading through all these missions, these crewed missions require a vigilance of the team and constant careful preparations as we continue to head into these critical parts of the mission. So just like the ISS and Roscosmos team carefully prepared for Mark's return and we are now getting ready to fly another set of four crew to the International Space Station and getting prepared for returning a set of four crew from the International Space Station. I know the teams will be telling you about how they are carefully getting ready for the steps and we're looking forward to all the missions going on over this next few months. Thank you. All right, thank you, Kathy. Next up, Steve Stitch, manager of NASA's commercial crew program. Steve? Yeah, th thanks, Dan. It is uh, great to be here. It's an exciting spring, as, as Kathy talked about. Um, and it feels good to be back in the swing of uh, launching and preparing for our crew rotation flight. Um, this is the fourth crew rotation mission. It's kind of almost surreal that we're here on this fourth mission, uh, launching four crew in the fourth month of the year on our fourth flight booster. So it's kind of a 444 mission for us. Uh, it's a huge accomplishment for our team and the industry. You know, we've been closely working with Dana and the ISS program on the Axiom mission, and I'll talk a little bit more about those dependencies, but because of the complexity of the Axiom, Axiom mission and where we're at with the crew for preparations, as Kathy said, uh, we are going to adjust the launch date uh, a little bit for Crew 4. Uh, we are doing that today at the Program Control Board. We'll uh, move that mission to uh, no earlier than April the 20th with a launch time of 6.37 a.m. Eastern Time. We would dock. Um, the docking time may be adjusted a little bit on April 21st, uh, probably around 6 a.m. Eastern or so, and we'll work that with the ISS team. And that really is just to give us a little more spacing between the two flights. Uh, and make sure that we have everything ready to go for the Crew 4 mission. Uh, of course, Jessica will talk more about the hardware, but uh, all the hardware for the mission is, is at the Cape and, and being prepared for launch for Crew 4. We'll have a, a brand new Dragon uh, spacecraft, Freedom, for this flight. Um, it just shipped from Hawthorne you know, a number of weeks ago, and it's going through processing at KSC. Uh, the SpaceX team has done a great job working both uh, the Crew 4 mission and the, uh, the Axiom mission as well. Um, you know, we are continuing to embark upon uh, reuse for the crewed missions, and in particular, this flight has a couple of items that are first time. Uh, the heat shield composite structure on Dragon will be reused for, um, uh, for the first time in the commercial crew program. We've been doing that on the CRS flights with Dana for a while, the cargo flights, and then we'll have reuse of four service section Draco thrusters as well. Um, of course, uh, as I talked about uh, for the booster, it's the fourth flight of this booster. This is the same booster we flew uh, for the Crew-3 flight, um, and uh, it flew one other flight in between those. We've, we've done all the analysis for the booster, and we're closing that work out, and we feel very good about the fourth flight booster. Um, we are, uh, it's very important, as Kathy talked about, Mark Van Hei returned uh, successfully uh, yesterday, and so for this flight, we are going to embark upon a direct handover. It's important for us to launch Crew 4 first, and then hand of a handover of approximately uh, five days or so, and then return the Crew 3 mission, so we're setting up for that. Um, I did talk to the Crew 3 astronauts this morning, along with Dana Weigel. Uh, they're doing well, their spacecraft endurance is doing well. They are excited about the upcoming Axiom mission. They're excited about Crew 4, and, and they told us uh, they're having a lot of fun on station and they're wait, re, willing to stay and do whatever we need. So, so they're doing well. The spacecraft is healthy. Um, probably one change, we're likely not to do a fly around on, on uh, Crew 3 return. We got uh, some good data from Crew 2, and we really don't need the fly around for Crew 3. The imagery is is not quite as uh, helpful as ISS once thought. So, so when we go on dock, um, right now we're not planning a fly around for Crew 3. And I think that's all I had, Dan, thanks. All right, thank you, Steve. Next up, Dana Weigel, Deputy Program Manager for NASA's International Space Station Program. Dana? 
Thank you, Dan. Let's see, continuing the safe launch and return of our crew and cargo vehicles is our highest priority on station. That's really what enables us to do all the amazing things that we do on board. Um, as you've gleaned already, we are in the midst of an extremely busy spring. Over the last few weeks, we had two spacewalks and we welcomed on board a new Soyuz crew. Um, and as you've heard mentioned, Mark Van de Hei, uh, returned yesterday on the Soyuz with uh, cosmonaut crewmates Piotr and, and Anton. Uh, Mark set a new record for the longest single spaceflight mission by an American with 350 days, 355 days on orbit, which is pretty impressive. Um, the Soyuz undock itself and all the ground recovery operations were, were very smooth. They all went kind of according to our nominal plan. And then the plane bringing Mark home just landed this morning at Ellington Field. So we're really excited to have him back home with us. Uh, right around the corner, looking forward to the Axiom-1 mission. That's our first private astronaut mission to space station. That's a major milestone for us uh, in continuing to expand commercial opportunities for use of low Earth orbit. So we're really looking forward to that. And as Steve said, the crew on board is ready to go. They're ready to welcome uh, new visitors. And then right after that, we'll have the Crew-4 launch. Uh, we are targeting the five-day handover, as Steve mentioned. Uh, during that time period, during the handover, we'll have 11 crew members on board. We'll have six Americans, three Russians, a German, and an Italian. So that'll be a neat time frame for us. And then right after that, we'll bring crew three home. And then in May, as Kathy mentioned, we have the Boeing OFT-2 mission, followed by SpaceX-25 cargo mission in early June. So a lot of dynamic activity uh, going on for us on board the, uh, the vehicle. Crew 4 will bring up Chell and Samantha. They've both been to station before. They each did an expedition. Uh, so we look forward to having their experience on board. And of course, we look forward to uh, newcomers, Bob and Jessica, joining us. They'll be up there with us until the fall time frame. A lot of research is planned. Um, we've got some material science, some uh, plant-related science, and also some health technologies. That's going to further some of the uh, capabilities that we need for going beyond low Earth orbit. It also brings a lot of benefits uh, to us here on Earth. Um, so I think Station is ready to uh, welcome Crew 4. And with that, Dan, I'll hand it back to you. All right. Thank you, Dana. Now we're going to head out to California. Jessica Jensen, the Vice President of Customer Operations and Integration at SpaceX. Jessica. Good morning. So I just want to say it's an honor to be here today um, with my NASA and ESA colleagues as we prepare for the next NASA crew mission to the International Space Station. Um, like everyone's mentioned, it's a, an exciting and busy time. Um, I just wanted to highlight a few things. Yeah, we talked about SLS and Orion are on the launch pad for in preparation for the Artemis 1 mission. And then we will be launching, SpaceX is going to be launching the Axiom 1 crew to the space station next week. They will stay on station for about a week, return home, and then shortly after that, the Crew-4 mission will launch. And I just wanted to highlight a few fun facts here that the Crew-4 launch is going to be SpaceX's seventh human spaceflight mission overall. And it's pretty wild since it just feels like yesterday that we flew Bob and Doug on the Demo-2 mission. That was actually only in May of 2020. So this is going to be, Crew-4 will be our seventh human spaceflight mission in just under two years. And I think if I did my math right, this is also going to be our 31st Dragon mission to the International Space Station. Um, we had cargo for a very long time, and then it's been a rotation of cargo and crew since then. Um, so yeah, it's a super busy time, really exciting. Um, and, and as Kathy mentioned, we, you know, even though it looks busy and kind of crazy, astronaut safety and mission safety is always our top priority. If we have to look at something closer and take the time to do that, we will. Um, so we, we have, we are appropriately staffed to handle all of these missions. Um, and yeah, it's the safety is number one. So let me give you an update on where the status of the vehicles. So like uh, Steve mentioned, we have a new Dragon vehicle that we're adding to the fleet. And then the Falcon 9 booster previously actually supported two missions to the International Space Station, uh, CRS-22 and Crew-3. And it also launched our Turksat 5B satellite. So right now, um, basically what the Crew-4 Dragon vehicle to have the capsule stacked onto the trunk. 
after that, the Dragon vehicle will be loaded with propellants, and then it will go through its final checkouts and closeouts. In parallel to that, Falcon 9 is also going through its final processing. Um, once those both come together, then we basically rotate Dragon over, we made it to the launch vehicle, and then we roll out for the dry dress rehearsal as well as static fire. Um, after that is completed, we do our final readiness review. It's called the launch readiness review. And that's basically where we ensure that the SpaceX teams, the NASA teams, the crew, and the ISS, and the FAA are all ready to launch and that we're good to proceed. So that'll all be coming up, and that will take us to the launch date of April 20th. And then, yeah, I think it's been previously mentioned, there'll be a short handover with Crew-3. Then we'll bring the Crew-3 astronauts home um, in late April. So... As always, yeah, I just want to thank NASA and ESA and thank you for your trust in us, for letting us work with and train your astronauts. Um, it's really been an honor for our team um, to work with Chell and Bob and Jessica and Samantha. And so we're really looking forward to this mission. Thanks. And back to you, Dan. All right. Thank you, Jessica. And now we're going to go over to Frank DeWinna, the manager of the International Space Station Program for ESA. Frank, take it away. And Frank, if you can hear me, you're muted. <laughs> the classical mistake. Good uh, morning, everybody in uh, Houston or in America. Good afternoon, if there are any listeners here in Europe. It's a pleasure, of course, to be here, uh, to be again uh, looking forward to the launch of a European astronaut on board of uh, a SpaceX vehicle together with our partners from NASA, but also from uh, SpaceX. So thank you for doing all that work for us. Uh, for us, it's a, it's a great moment, of course, uh, to look forward to. It's now the third mission in a row. It's a unique experience for, for ESA that uh, for one and a half years, we will have uh, ESA astronauts on board of the International Space Station. Uh, we had Thomas Petzke in the Alpha mission. Uh, we have uh, Matthias Maurer from Germany in the Cosmic Kiss mission. And uh, we now will have Samantha Cristoforetti in the Minerva mission. Uh, going up. Uh, Samantha is her second uh, long duration space flight. So we're really looking forward uh, to that. Uh, as uh, the one female astronaut uh, today in the European Astronaut Corps, of course, she is a role model for us. She's a role model for uh, Europe. And she has really played a great role in the, the new astronaut selection that we are doing. Uh, we had uh, about uh, 23,000 candidates. Uh, and we are currently trying to narrow this down to the, the four to six that will eventually be selected. Uh, but the great success already was that uh, more than a quarter of the candidates today uh, were uh, female uh, candidates. That was uh, a great improvement from the last uh, selection. And Samantha certainly played a big role uh, in that. Uh, for the rest, of course, we are looking forward to all the science activities that will be done on, on orbit. Uh, just to name a few, uh, we are looking into biological research with uh, Astrospira, basically trying to see if photobioreactors can be used in life support systems of the future if we go forward to the moon or uh, even further uh, to Mars. We have a lot of experiments on uh, fluid dynamics in our uh, fluid uh, science facility, uh, looking into compositions of foam, for example, foam that can be very important in lightweight structures for future aerospace uh, design, uh, but also foam that is uh, instrumental in uh, making all the isolation material uh, that we need uh, the, tomorrow to fight uh, climate change uh, here on Earth. So very uh, important experiments for us. And uh, also we are doing, as usually, uh, uh, research on the human body, uh, physiological research, uh, myotones, for example, looking at the muscle tones and skin tones of, of astronauts exactly uh, to see as well if they go into longer duration space flights in the future uh, to the moon and to mars uh, how this will influence their their well-being in the spacecraft so overall uh, we're looking forward to uh, to a great mission uh, it's uh, it's exciting times as well for for europe we are preparing for our ministerial conference at the end of the year where we will ask the the budget and the funding for the next uh, three years. Uh, we're looking forward to ISS extension 
uh, and our Terra Nova program, which is now our exploration program, uh, it's called, is growing. Looking forward to flying astronauts to the gateway, but also further than the gateway, uh, Europe is also looking forward to having its own European astronauts one day on the surface of the moon. So uh, all in all, very exciting times and these missions, these back to back missions of our biggest member states, uh, France, Germany and Italy, of course, play a major role in, into this. So thanks a lot uh, to our partners again, uh, NASA and SpaceX uh, for making this happen for us. All right. Thank you, Frank. So now we're going to jump over to question and answer. I'm going to start here in the room and then we'll go on to the phone bridge. If you are dialed into the phone bridge, please press star one. If you have a question, that'll put you in our queue. And then you can press star two to get out if your question's been answered. So, and reminder, we have briefers remote. So if you can address your question to somebody, that will just help us keep everything sorted. Um, so I'll start here in the room, Mark. Uh, thank you, uh, Mark Corot for Aviation Week and Space Technology. I believe this is for Dana. Uh, Dana, um, have you been able to to chase down the the moisture issue in the spacewalk helmet from the last spacewalk? And if so, um, is there a remedy, or was there an explanation where you can just proceed further? Um, I'm sort of asking that in the context of continuing work with the uh, solar array upgrade. And so maybe you could address where that stands and where you hope to go with Crew 4 on that. Thank you. Sure. Um, we, we are still looking into it. Um, you know, as, as we've noted at the end of the EVA, there was some moisture. It's a thin layer of, of liquid that was um, on the surface of the bubble of Mateus's um, helmet. Uh, it's more than what we would normally see. You know, the suit can uh, spit water is, is kind of the phenomenon. It's got a cooling system and just like you would experience kind of on the ground, you can have condensation. And so you can have liquid that might kind of spit out. I think we've seen that on about 12 EVAs overall, but, but the, the general experience is that's a, very, that's a very small amount. This was a bit more than normal, so we want to take that very seriously. It was um, quite a bit less than what we had experienced on EVA 23 when we had the major anomaly, but, but still water, liquid water, you know, in the suit is, is a concern. And so we've got an investigation team taking a look at it. Um, it gets really complex in terms of, you know, you've got to do troubleshooting on orbit and we can't immediately bring things home and, and look at samples. So it usually takes us a little bit of getting hardware back and forth to really do a proper investigation. Um, so we don't yet know the cause, but it's our intention to go go look at the cause and, and go address that. Um, we actually did bring some water samples home on the Soyuz flight, so we brought some home with Mark. So we'll take a look at that. We don't see any indications of any kind of a water quality issue, but that'll be something that we'll be interested to look at. Um, we did some troubleshooting on board, and, and the suit looks fine. We can't. Uh, recreate the issue, which could be a sign that um, this is related to kind of the cooling system, the amount of moisture we had in it and the condensation, but it's really too early to say that. Um, <clears throat> the other suits look fine. There's no issue with them. They, they don't have any indications of a problem, but we'll be conservative and, and be keeping an eye on that. If we got into a case where we had to do a contingency EVA, certainly we'd go look at the mitigations and what we know in the investigation. and. Uh, we would not use that particular suit as we're trying to understand uh, what happened to it. So we're pretty early in that, but we are taking a really close look to see if we can better understand why we had that much water in that suit. All right. Thank you, Dana. Steve? Uh, news. This one's for Steve. You talked about we've got AX-1 launching next week, Crew-4, and clearly the demand for private space missions to the space station is growing up. How tough and challenging is it to manage that schedule? Yeah, I, I think that's a good question. As Kathy said, we're really, and, and the benefit for the commercial crew program is with, with SpaceX, we have tremendous fleet inside. I would say they're a tremendous partner. So we get to look at the Dragon spacecraft for both the um, Axiom launch and ours. And so what we're doing is just taking it sort of, I would say, one step at a time. So uh, that Axiom spacecraft has been fueled and it's headed up to 39A today to go mate with the vehicle. And so we just take it day by day 
and then uh, watch our vehicle day by day as well. And so uh, I think we understand the key decision points for anything like this where you're managing two complicated missions. It's really what are the decision points you need to make and when. And um, so far, our team's been able to, to manage it in concert with SpaceX. And if we get into a scenario where we're not comfortable, we'll do what we did. You know, we moved the launch for Crew 4 already a day. We just need a little bit more time and spacing between those flights. And so we'll continue to do that. So. All right, thanks, Steve. One more in the room. Hi, this is Andrea Leinfelder of the Houston Chronicle. Um, this question is for Jessica and then Steve. Um, can you confirm that the Freedom Crew Dragon currently being built which is the fourth one, is the last one SpaceX will build, and then you will instead focus on Starship? And is four enough for the commercial crew program moving forward? Thank you. Hey, this is Jessica. I can start with that one. So yes, this is, right, so this is the fourth um, Dragon 2 vehicle, Dragon 2 crewed vehicle that we are adding to the fleet. While it is the last, you know, full vehicle that is coming out of our factory as a whole, we are, you know, our production line is basically still going to be partly open. I think some people think it just all shuts down and it's done. But in reality, we have a very active refurbishment and spares program. We also have to continue to build new trunks and a lot of new hardware for every mission. So even though this is kind of the last, you know, hopefully the last full vehicle we have to build all as one, we are constantly gonna have basically all the parts available. So if you think of a Dragon vehicle made up of all of its different parts, we're gonna have ability to swap out those parts to keep the life going for a very long time. And then overall, we are working to um, fully certify the vehicle with NASA for five flights. And so if you have the fleet of um, four vehicles, over five flights, you get up to 20 missions. And then additionally, we're gonna even go beyond that and we can keep certifying hardware up to more and more flights. So we're gonna make sure that the Dragon vehicle is ready, available, and certified to support all the missions that NASA will need to the space station for both crew and cargo. And I will say these are the four vehicles is for crew. We have the cargo variant as well that is act that has several vehicles in the fleet. Yeah, I would say from a NASA perspective and CCP, we've been working hand in hand with SpaceX to look at the, the sparing strategy, right? And I came from the space shuttle world and at some points we probably didn't have enough spares and we've been talking to SpaceX about that. So we've got a sparing strategy as Jessica talked about. Um, as she said, they have not shut down production lines so they can still make thrusters, they can still make the heat shield laminate, they can still make all the components they need. And so when we looked at it so far with the four vehicles, it, it looks pretty good of getting out through the end of, of Space Station. Uh, but again, as Jessica said, we've got a good spare strategy in place. They're building up spares for things like tanks and pod panels and heat shields, and, and that'll help us carry us out. And then, as Jessica said, we'll continue to embark upon this five flight uh, certification for reuse for Dragon. And when we do that, you know, I, I think that puts us in a good spot to go out to the end of, of uh, Space Station. So. All right, thank you, Steve. We're gonna jump over to the phone bridge now. Again, if you have a question, hit star one to get into the queue. If your question's been answered, you can press star two to get out. Let's start off at the top with Jeff Faust and Space News. Jeff? Hey, good morning. Uh, question for any of the NASA personnel when I answer this. Uh, curious about the status of the uh, deep barter agreement with Roscosmos, uh, whether that will be complete in time to affect a uh, crew swap for the Crew-5 and fall Soyuz missions, and at what point do you need uh, a decision in place regarding crew assignments uh, for those upcoming missions? Thanks. So um, the uh, agreement is still over with our Roscosmos uh, government agencies. Um, the team continues to work together to kind of protect for it, and I'll have Dana jump in when I'm done. But um, you know, we had a uh, uh, cosmonaut here getting sized for suits. We're looking at, you know, different options for our crew members, um, potentially being backup crew members on a Soyuz. So we're kind of starting to lay in kind of the prudent, you know, long-term measures to be able to enable. At some point, and Dana can tell you, at some point, if we don't get the paperwork, out of the Russian government and over to our side of the government, you know, we'll have to, um, we won't have enough time to be able to support crew training and operations for a crew five 
but I'll tell you, we still feel like that's our long-term logistics strategy, and so we'll continue to look at having it in place then for the next crewed mission. But Dana, you jump in with the timeline. Yeah, I, I'll just add to what Kathy said. It's really important uh, for us programmatically. It gives us a lot more robust capability to fly crew on each other's vehicles. Um, we're very much aligned with a. Uh, Roscosmos in that goal. Both of us have our own processes we have to work through. You know, they have their own version of a foreign ministry they've got to work through, et cetera. So they're going through that process. Um, you know, some of the critical timelines are really suit builds. That kind of becomes kind of the first thing that, that we hit that uh, you've got to build, you know, a suit if you're flying on Soyuz or a suit over here. And as Kathy mentioned, we've already started that work over here on, on our side. Uh, for the cosmonaut, uh, you know, candidate crew. Um, we haven't started that work yet on, on the Russian side. They need to finish some of their work first. So that's one of the critical milestones for us. I don't have specific schedules. You know, everyone continues to look and kind of refine how far out you could push that. And then training is the next consideration. We have to keep the training going. And so the teams are working together to keep all of those things progressing. Uh, but there's a, a, a point in time where you kind of hit hit a limit and you either got to have the plan in place or we, or we have to push it out a little. So we're not there yet. We're still both working jointly on it and we're hopeful we can uh, stay on those timelines. All right, thank you, Dana. Thank you, Kathy. Next up, Stephen Clark, Space Flight Now. Stephen? Thank you uh, for my, uh, taking my question. Uh, just to follow up on that last question, are there any uh, cosmonauts currently in the U.S. training uh, for Dragon or ISS missions and also vice versa, any uh, U.S. astronauts currently in Russia for training? And uh, also I was hoping maybe Steve Stitch uh, or uh, Kathy could talk about the target uh, nominal landing dates for the AX-1 and Crew-3 missions, assuming uh, the launches remain on schedule and assuming good weather and all that. Dana, you want to take the first one? Yeah, I'll take the first one. Um, let's see, in terms of overall training plans, following up with what we were just talking about, um, we've got some flexibility in terms of what we can do. We have had folks over here in, in country uh, participating in, in training. We don't currently have anyone um, over here. Both teams have plans laid in, including uh, when our crew would need to go over for training right now, we don't happen to have any ongoing, but uh, we have both been working towards our nominal integrated uh, training plans between our crew traveling to Russia and uh, cosmonauts traveling over here. And I, and I can take the approximate undock and landing dates uh, for Axiom. Uh, you know, we'll launch on 4-6, and uh, it is a flight day three rendezvous, so docking very early in the morning on 4-8. Uh, you know, eight, eight days, eight dock days that Dana talked about means an undock around the, the 16th or so and landing on the 16th or 17th, which gives us plenty of spacing uh, to get to the 420 Crew 4 launch. And then, you know, Crew 4 right now, that um, would be about a 24 hour rendezvous for the 20th launch. Um, and so I would anticipate an undock about five days later, so around uh, uh, the 25th or 26th in the landing. I don't have the specific landing times because we just adjusted the date, but s somewhere around there, um, you know, 24 hours after that. So that would be the plan right now. All right, moving on, we have Joey Roulette. I think you're freelance right now, Joey. Yeah, thanks for taking my question. Um, this one's for either Dana or Cassie. Um, did any of the NASA officials in Kazakhstan for Vandahe's return yesterday um, have any discussions with Russian partners on the commitment on their commitment to the International Space Station, um, and if so, how do those talks go? And and then if not, um, I was wondering if you could just give a sense of of where things stand on your discussions with the Russian partners, particularly on um, their space station commitments um, as Rogozin, you know, tries to get those U.S. sanctions removed on those Russian companies. Thanks. Down our path for station extension across the board. Um, you know, we're really right now headed towards a multilateral control board in the June timeframe. Um, one of the first steps in that is at the program level, Joel and Dana will be, be conducting their space station control board with their, their international space station partners getting ready 
and talking about each of the individual partner station extension plans, which are all continuing to make progress. And then at the headquarters level, we'll be, we'll be planning to have, following that, a multilateral control board for that. All of our international partners, including Roscosmos, are making progress on moving towards station extension um, through 2030. It, it's, but we all have to go through the process, just like we talked about the careful process for us to get ready for human space flight. There's a careful budget process <laughs> and, a, and go, final government approval process that all of us have to go through to get through these next steps. But um, we all understand the importance of this continued partnership, even in really, really, really tough times, and that this is important for us to continue to work together and maintain, for some of us, which have been decades in low Earth orbit, um, and continue to create the safe, pl safe place for us to do research and technology development together in space. And Dana, jump in with anything you'd like to add. Oh, I think that's great. Um, you know, at the program level, um, we continue discussions and continue working towards uh, 2030. Um, they, they touched on the subject of when uh, Joel Montabano was in, in Russia and, you know, no, no changes at all to the, the plans. As Kathy mentioned, you know, each one of our partners has a process they go through. Some of them it can take up to a year. You know, it's not unlike the budgetary cycles that we go through where you have to get appropriated and there's a lot of discussions that take place through each government agency. And so each one of the partnerships is working their way through that. Um, we get periodic updates, and as Kathy said, um, probably our next big large update for us is either end of April or early May at the program level, and then we'll do that at uh, Kathy and the headquarters level across all the agencies to uh, get a better understanding of where everyone is in their process for the 2030 extension. All right, next question is going to come from David Curley, Discovery Channel. David? Thanks very much, Dan. Um, I guess it's for Steve or Jessica. Can you talk a little bit uh, detailed about the heat shield components um, reused from which spacecraft, how many times? Uh, have you got a sense of the average of how many times you might be able to use these components? Thank you. Uh, let's see, I can start. And I, um, sp I don't remember the specific spacecraft that we were using. The, in, and what we're talking about really is not necessarily the, um, the TPS material for, uh, for this particular flight, but we're talking about uh, the structure essentially that, that, that the thermal protection system uh, mounts to or, or is attached to that's being reused. I want to say it was one of the CRS flights. Uh, right now, NASA has only approved a one-time reuse uh, of, that, of that heat shield. We went through a, a very specific analysis for this flight uh, to get to that um, reuse, and we're going to work with SpaceX to try to figure out, you know, can we go more than one reuse? And, and I'll turn it over to Jessica, and, um, and she may have more details on which flight it came from. Yeah, yeah, actually, I don't have anything. Oops, I don't have anything to add from that. Thanks, Steve. All right. Moving on, next question comes from Marsha Dunn, Associated Press. Marsha? Steve, please. Um, Jessica Watkins is going to be making um, her own history, becoming the first black woman to actually live in, live aboard the space station. I'd like you to comment on that if you could. And I'm also checking to see if Jeanette Epps is still assigned to the first operational Starliner flight. And given that's still out there in the distance, um, how come her she hasn't had a mission sooner um, or at least moved up to um, one of the SpaceX flights? Thanks. Yeah. You want me to speak to Jessica? Yeah, you can. you can start. Yeah, yeah. I, You know, I think Frank actually said it well. Um, you know, he, he relayed the uh, European ESA's experience with uh, the benefits of having Samantha fly and how just her, her flying and being a role model for ESA was able to kind of garner interest and, and uh, kind of help, you know, outreach and, and, and probably broaden a lot of 
a lot of thoughts folks had about what's achievable for them to do. And so I look at this very similarly. You know, we really ought to have very diverse crews. You know, the more diverse we are, the more relatable, you know, space flight is to everyone. And, and the reality is anyone could go and, and do that if they, they, you know, chose to make that their dream. So I think it's fantastic. And, uh, and I think, you know, Frank's sentiments about Samantha very much hold true for Jessica, and I hope it inspires a whole new generation of space travelers. You want to talk to yeah, I, crew I can, assignments? I can talk to crew assignments a little bit. Uh, Jeanette is still uh, assigned to Starliner 1, the first PCM flight. Um, I think we'll be looking at the, the crew assignments with uh, the, the flight ops director here a little bit for, for those flights coming up and, and um, maybe adjusting those in the summer time frame. And I got to meet with the crew the other day, um, Ch Chell and Jessica and the whole crew, and, and you could just see the excitement in Jessica, and she's very excited to go fly. I think that, you know, what I hope that will inspire a lot of other uh, young African-American ladies to maybe pursue math and science and, and, and the astronaut corps at some point. So, I mean, I look forward to seeing her on orbit. It's always great when you watch these crew members go through their initial training as an astronaut and you see them then get assigned to a flight and you can just see their excitement. And when we talked to Jessica the other day, she was extremely excited about the flight and you could tell she's ready to go. And that's, that's what uh, Chell and the whole crew told me. They, they said, hey, we know you've got a very complicated spring and we're gonna be ready to go when you're ready. And so that was really exciting for me to see. Okay, next up we have Robert Perlman, Collect Space. Robert. Thanks. Um, for Jessica, um, given that this is now the fourth Crew Dragon, is there anything different in design, even minor, between, let's say, the first Dragon, Endeavor, and, and now Freedom? Um, and would there be any way of determining what Dragon you're in if you were inside? Is there any visual cue as to which one you're, you're positioned in? Hey, good question. So SpaceX, basically, our, our philosophy is as we fly vehicles, we continually learn from them. So any, even if it's a minor issue, anything we see. Um, so, for example, I think some of you have heard, you know, we had some issues with the waste system. Um, we learned about that on the Inspiration4 mission. And then we made some design changes to that. Now, that wouldn't actually be visible to the crew, but these are design changes that we implement to improve safety of the vehicle and safety for the astronauts. And we coordinate all those changes with NASA ahead of time, make sure they're on board, that they can certify them, and then we go ahead and make those changes. But there's actually been, you know, noticeable to the astronauts, not that many changes. Um, we had some changes on the trunk fins and the waste system. Um, so it's been, you know, some things, but I'd say overall pretty minor. I don't think you'd walk in and say, whoa, that's a totally different vehicle um, from the first one to this one. And I, I can add just a couple of things, Jessica, if I, if I can. Um, I, I would say if you're in the crew, this vehicle compared to the others, probably the one minor thing you might notice is there's a USB port to actually uh, recharge their laptops, and that's one little minor thing. Uh, the cargo pallet's a little different in this uh, Crew 4 vehicle, and I think uh, the plan is to retrofit the other vehicles. And overall, when you just look at from uh, the Demo 2 vehicle to this one, probably the one most significant change is there's, there's essentially a common structure between the cargo vehicles and the crew vehicles now, and, and, and they start out as a common structure and then they get modified a little bit. But for the most part, these vehicles are all the same, and, and SpaceX does a great job if there's uh, as they watch the systems perform in flight of making modifications to make them safer and safer for future flights. So there's little minor changes, but overall, if you're a crew member, you, if you stuck your head in there, you might not even notice the difference. So. All right, moving along, our next question comes from Chelsea Gould at space.com. Chelsea. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Uh, so it was mentioned previously that with four dragons, uh, you know, now that will be flying up to five flights each to the space station. Um, it should basically get us to the end of the space station's lifespan. Um, is there currently a plan in place for Crew Dragon usage after the, after the station's lifespan comes to a close? Hey, this is Jessica. I can answer that one. So, right, as of now, we're planning to make sure our number one priority is make sure that we keep providing the crew and cargo services that the space station needs. That's our main priority. Then 
um, for what I would call maybe free flyer commercial passenger missions that don't go to the space station, we will basically evaluate over the next few years, should that be a Dragon mission or would that be a Starship mission? It's just going to depend on the readiness of the Starship vehicle, um, mission profiles, things like that, as to whether we would select a Dragon or a Starship for future human spaceflight missions that are not going to the space station. Okay, thank you, Jessica. Our next question comes from Marcia Smith, spacepolicyonline.com. Uh, thanks so much. My question has to do with schedules and cadence. And uh, I'm curious, what is the projected launch date for Crew-5? And exactly when is it that you have that drop-dead date that you have to decide who the crew members are going to be and if Anna Kakina is going to be one of them? And then if OFT-2 goes as goes well in May, what have you got penciled in for the crew flight test and for Starliner 1? And then once you have Starliner flying, it, it, are you like alternating crew dragons and Starliners, one each a year, or what is the cadence once they're both operational? Yeah, I, 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 I can start, uh, and then maybe Dana can jump, jump in. So um, uh, first of all, let, let's we'll talk a little bit about the Boeing flight. Um, the plan right now is to launch uh, OFT2 in, in May, right after the beta cutout, uh, around May 20th. Uh, that flight is on track. Uh, in fact, uh, the final, the booster is shipping today to head down to KSC. That we'll start stacking that booster uh, on the 19th and prep for that flight. Um, the service module and crew module are mated. Uh, they tomorrow we start a big test of the integrated test on the on the crew module and the service module, uh, a big integrated test. Uh, a lot of the valve work is starting to wrap up, uh, and we're in, on good track for that. And then, and then relative, so that flight would fly in, in May, and then the plan right now is to fly the, the crewed flight test uh, by the end of the year toward the late end of this calendar year. And as Kathy said, we'll basically step back and, and look at the performance of OFT2, and then evaluate when to go fly CFT. And then overall, the long-term strategy is to alternate between SpaceX and Boeing once Boeing completes the crewed flight test and certification, then we'll alternate, you know, one, one flight uh, a year with, uh, for the space station missions uh, for, for Boeing and SpaceX. So that's the long-term strategy. Um, you know, right now we're still working with Dana on the exact timing of, uh, of the Crew-5 mission. It'll be in the, likely the September timeframe. And uh, relative to the backup crew plan, we've got a, a plan for backup crew we're working with, uh, with Dana and Rose Cosmos to try to understand uh, when we get this agreement in place. And then I think we've got, you know, a little more time before we'd have to pull the trigger on a backup crew member. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Our next question is going to come from Stuart Wolpert with UCLA News Report. Stuart. Thank you very much. Um, I think you said that you expect benefits of the Crew 4 mission to include health technology and plant science. Can you say a bit more about this? What do you hope to learn about health technology and plant science? Thank you. Yeah, you know, um, we can get you specifics on any of the experiments that you want. So let me just talk about some of our, our general goals that we hope to advance. I mean, I think, you know, everyone probably appreciates and understands, um, or, or maybe you don't. So I'll, I'll just say, you know, uh, if you want to do really, really long duration space flight, like out to, to Mars and beyond, um, we all know we need vitamins, we need minerals. Um, some of those aren't that stable and don't stay for a long period of time. For example, vitamin C breaks down. And so one of the ways you can, you can deal with that is through having live crops, live plants and growth. And so we're very interested in that. I'll tell you our crew members, even for six month flights, also really, really appreciate just kind of having fresh food. Um, I once asked a crew member when they came home what they missed most and they told me lettuce. And it was the crunch and, and um, you know, so, so for us, uh, the ability to grow plants and to really understand um, how we would do that uh, is really important. How do we incorporate it into spacecraft? You know, do we really have growing chambers? Do we have plants all over the place? Does it look like a farm? So we have a lot of work that we're really interested in progressing um, in that arena. You know, in, in the health area, there's a range of things we're always trying to understand. There's some a lot of aspects with human health, you hear us talk about that a lot. We know that the body changes, um, the body changes in microgravity, and then in some cases, some aspects continue to change with longer duration spaceflight. 
And so um, we're always looking for um, a couple different aspects. One is diagnostics. What can we do better to understand the situation on board and the health of our, our crew members? That also helps us understand kind of the efficacy of, of uh, preventative measures that we're using. Um, we have learned a lot, you know, through the years. We've, we've really done a lot to really um, deal with the risks of, of bone loss, muscle change, that type of thing. And so we continue to, to look in areas both with um, research for our crew, but then also other technologies that can either help us mitigate things or help us diagnostically. And we can get you a rundown of all the specific details if you're interested in that. Thanks, Dana and Stuart. Yeah, I can follow up with you and give you just a rundown of specific projects that Crew 4 are expected to work on. Okay, I've got one more on the phone bridge. Uh, Stephen Clark, Spaceflight Now, one more time. Stephen? Can you hear me, Stephen? Yep, yes, can you hear me now? Yep, gotcha, go for it. Thanks, Dan. Uh, thanks for taking a second question from me. I think this one's for uh, Frank Devin. Um, regarding the European robotic arm, uh, just wanted to get an update on your plans for activating that arm. I know at one point, um, Matthias Marr or uh, Samantha Christopheretti were planning to do a spacewalk in the Orlan suits. Is that still, uh, plan for a joint spacewalk with the Russian cosmonauts. Um, can you just talk about generally the status of, uh, of activating that? Is is that been put on hold or is it still going forward? Thanks. Yeah, thank you for uh, the question. So uh, we are moving forward with the commissioning and the initial on orbit uh, validation of the European robotic arm. Uh, there were some technical issues discovered uh, I would say in uh, the September, December timeframe last year uh, that were related to uh, bus communication issues uh, between the, the central computer and the service module and uh, the European robotic arm computer. Uh, these issues have been solved right now. So we have a solid plan together with our uh, Russian colleagues to do the uh, on-orbit validation of the, the era. Uh, unfortunately, uh, due to those delays, uh, the, the spacewalk that was planned for Matthias uh, cannot longer take place. Uh, as uh, we were just discussing, uh, Crew 3 is planned to come back uh, by the end of, uh, of April. And the first spacewalks, the first two, uh, are planned, uh, I think, in the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, and then the, the spacewalk that was planned for Matthias is only planned in May, uh, June timeframe uh, right now. Uh, because of the delays, uh, technical delays that we had. Uh, we are still uh, looking uh, into uh, the possibility for Samantha uh, to do an EVA uh, together with uh, with our Russian colleagues from uh, Roscosmos. Also there, the plans have changed. Uh, there is not uh, a definite answer at this moment, uh, but we are pursuing the options for uh, Samantha still to do uh, an EVA uh, related to the European robotic arm. And we still hope to finalize the whole uh, in-orbit validation of ERA uh, by September, October uh, this year, which is, of course, uh, quite some delay. Uh, before what, what we expected, it was expected by June uh, this year. Uh, but okay, technical issues uh, happen. Uh, space is not easy, we all know that. Uh, we discover things on orbit. The, the main thing is that we can fix them and that we can move forward. Okay, thank you, Frank. I've got one final one on the phone bridge, and then I've got two follow-ups here in the room, and then we'll wrap. So last one on the phone bridge, Marcia Smith, Space Policy Online. Marcia. Um, thanks so much for giving me a second question. I was wondering if Kathy or Dana could tell us how Mark is feeling after his year in space, and are there – I know that his year in space wasn't exactly planned from the beginning, but do you have plans for future year in space? missions and what have you learned from uh, from the uh, year in space that you had with Scott Kelly and uh, Courtney Inko? Hey, Dana, I'll let you take it. Okay. Um, let's see. We haven't been able to talk directly to Mark yet, though uh, our team members have. Clearly, they flew back with him and they just landed this morning. But, but all accounts are he's doing great. If you uh, saw the landing video, um, you know, he, he looked fantastic. So, um, no issues at all. Everything very normal and what we'd expect. You know, when crew members first come home, there's a lot of dizziness. It is hard to adjust that that happens, even if you have a shorter duration flight. Um, 
So he's he's doing great. In terms of long duration flight, you know, there's a lot we learn. I talked a minute ago about uh, changes that the body undergoes. Um, and we don't yet really know enough to really understand. So we understand a lot about six month space flight. We understand a lot about changes in the bone and changes in the muscle, changes in the eye. What we really don't um, know yet or what are all those things that we would learn if everyone, if we had that whole same data set that was flying to one year. Um, we think we've done a great job with, with exercise and conditioning to mitigate a lot of the bone and muscle loss, for example, having more data points you know, out to a year will certainly help us really understand the efficacy of, of what we've done so far and also um, how certain things progress like eye degradation. Um, so I couldn't rattle off for you every single thing we've learned with uh, Mark. We certainly could get that to you. I'll just tell you that it, it's in the, the vein of really trying to expand our understanding about what does that additional time on orbit do and projecting what might it do even longer. Of course, Mars missions are even longer than that. So we're absolutely um, interested in doing more long duration missions. Um, for us, obviously the flight campaign and having uh, steady flights between our two providers is key for us really looking at um, how and when we'd fly uh, different crew members, the, the swapping back and forth with Soyuz and, and our vehicles, all of that's a factor in terms of how and when you would go and use strategies like that. But um, it does continue to be an important um, focal point for us to really understand what even longer duration space flight does. All right, thanks, Dana. Got time for quick follow-ups in the room. I think, Andrew, you had your hand up. Uh, thanks for the extra question. Um, we hadn't talked about parachutes in a while. I know um, the last few missions, they one parachute lagged. And it was within normal parameters, but you guys were still looking into it. Can you give us an update on that? Thanks. Yeah, I, I, I can take that question. So, um, so yeah, we've had the, the last two flights, uh, the Crew 2 return and the CRS-24 return. We had one of the four main chutes that was uh, lagged a little bit behind in its full inflation. Uh, so what we have done, um, and, and we we took an in-flight anomaly on Crew Two, and once we saw the what happened on Cirrus Twenty Four, I held that sign off of that anomaly, closing out for Crew Two. What we did uh, after uh, the Cirrus Twenty Four flight is we went and looked at all the hardware, all four of the main chutes. Was there anything that we saw that was anomalous? And we didn't find anything on that. We didn't find anything on Crew Two when we looked at all that hardware. We went back in partnership side by side with SpaceX and we looked at all the data from the entry, all the GNC parameters. Was there anything anomalous with the, with the GNC that might have had some certain rate to, to cause a, a slow inflation? We couldn't find anything there. So we went back and then looked at some of our testing that we have done, um, uh, both in the, the first shoot, was what's called a Mark II and Mark III. And what we really have seen is for this particular kind of shoot, it does have this propensity at times um, as three chutes get out and inflate and sort of catch air, one of them gets a little star for air and it will be a little slow to, to inflate. Uh, in all the data that we've seen so far, we, we know that chute will finally inflate and we know it won't be more than one chute. So that's our resolution for going ahead and flying uh, Crew 4, launching and also uh, returning the Crew 3 vehicle. So. All right, thanks, Steve. Uh, Mark? Uh, thank you, uh, Mark Caro, uh, for Aviation Week and Space Technology. Uh, regarding uh, Mark Van de Heij, is he clear to live at home now, or does he uh, take some observation here for a period, and if so, how long? Yeah, all, all our crew members, when they um, return, um, uh, we have teams, we have a, a physician, and we have physiological experts that work with the crew to kind of do what we would call post-flight conditioning. I, I don't know off the top of my head what the duration of that is, but um, you know, we have on-site capabilities in a, in a, in a gym there, and, it, and we have a pool, and so there's a lot of conditioning uh, that the crew undergoes. They, they do, you know, dizziness and, and kind of getting your balance back is one of the key things that, that takes, you know, a few days to a week to kind of get back, and so they work on that as well as just general kind of um, 
conditioning. So we can get you, if you're interested in, in the very specific, you know, durations, we could get that. But there is there is definitely post-flight um, work. Their family's actually already with them. Their family came out to Ellington, and so they joined their family immediately. And so they're, they're back with their family immediately um, as they're going through their post-flight, you know, conditioning and, and getting back to acclimating to the, uh, the 1G environment. All right. Thanks, Dana. And Gina, did you have one more? I've got about a minute. Um, I think a lot of things have worked. Um, they're certainly better on orbit at, at growing green things than I am on the ground, so my hat's off to them. Um, you know, some of the things, there, you know, we've got a couple different facilities that, are, that we're capable of using for, for some of the research. Um, one is very, very controlled, and we can control levels of gases and a lot of other things there. And so they're really trying to explore not just uh, the ability to grow things, but but what's what's different? Water delivery systems are a challenge. You know, we, you all know what it looks like here at water plants, and you can imagine there you've got to come up with these kind of complex systems that you can embed the roots in. You don't just have soil, and so some of the things we're really trying to learn are um, about the facility and the capabilities surrounding the plants that best either mimic or support their growth. Um, so we have learned a lot about like the water delivery systems as an example. Um, you all know too that your plants lean towards the sun. You all probably know too that peppers, for example, will hang down. Um, there's different phenomena in microgravity, you know, that the, the peppers don't, don't do that. So in, in terms of a practical sense, we've made a lot of headway in terms of being able to grow them. I think our researchers could tell you a lot of really other interesting things that they've really found that are probably differences between uh, 1G and, and 0G. I don't know those off the top of my head, but there are a lot of you know, observations that, that we put back into the facilities to, to really try to optimize how we grow things. And you know, the cool thing for the crew is in addition to returning samples for the uh, researchers, we um, let them eat some of it. So they got to eat some like hatch chili peppers recently. So I, I know the crew is always excited to help participate in those. All right, thank you, Dana. That's gonna wrap it up for us today. Reminder, in just 30 minutes from now, we're gonna hear from the Crew 4 astronauts themselves. So stick around to hear more about their mission coming up to the International Space Station. Thanks one more time to all of my briefers today, everybody for tuning in to ask questions. Stick around for the crew, but that'll do it for us from now, and we'll talk to you soon. Good morning from Mission Control in Houston at the International Space Station Flight Control Room here at the Johnson Space Center. We are just one hour and change away from the homecoming of NASA astronaut Mark Vandehei and Russian cosmonaut Pyotr Dubrov after almost a year in space for those two and 176 days in space for Soyuz Commander Anton Shkaplerov. The trio are suited up in their Sokol launch and entry suits, ready for a deorbit burn of 4 minute 39 second retrograde firing, a braking maneuver of the Soyuz MS-19 engine to uh, complete uh, the trip uh, 
in orbit for this trio that undocked from the International Space Station almost three hours ago. Everything aboard the Soyuz spacecraft is in readiness for the deorbit burn that will enable the Soyuz to drop out of orbit and begin its descent back into the Earth's atmosphere with all of its uh, systems honed in.
This is NASA TV. Good afternoon from NASA's Johnson Space Center and welcome to NASA's SpaceX Crew-4 Crew News Conference. We are joined here today by the four astronauts from Crew-4, NASA astronauts Chell Lindgren, Bob Hines, and Jessica Watkins, as well as European Space Agency astronaut Samantha Cristoforetti. NASA's SpaceX Crew-4 mission is set to launch aboard the Crew Dragon Freedom spacecraft on a Falcon 9 rocket to the International Space Station from Launch Complex 39A at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The commander of the Crew-4 mission is Chell Lindgren, and he is also commander of the Crew Dragon spacecraft. Chell is responsible for um, all phases of flight from launch to re-entry, and this will be his second trip to space. Bob Hines is the pilot for the Crew Dragon spacecraft and second in command for the mission. He is responsible for the vehicle's uh, performance and systems, and this will be Bob's first trip to space. Jessica Watkins is a mission specialist for Crew-4. She will work closely with the commander and pilot to monitor the spacecraft systems during the dynamic phases of launch and reentry, and this will be Jessica's first trip to space. Samantha Christopher Reddy is also a mission specialist for Crew-4. She will work closely alongside Chell Bob and Jessica, and this will be Samantha's second trip to space. We will be taking uh, questions here in the room and on the phone, phone bridge and also through social media using the hashtag AskNASA. But before we get to questions, I would like to invite the Crew 4 Commander, Chell Lindgren, to make an opening statement. Take it away, Chell. Thank you, Dylan. Um, well, first of all, thank you to everyone that's uh, here in the room today and uh, joining us online and on social media. Um, it's really exciting to have this opportunity to kind of formally talk about what we're going to accomplish um, on the space station during this upcoming mission. You know, I know that I speak for the entire crew when we say that we are incredibly excited um, about this opportunity. It is such a privilege uh, to get a, to be a part of this team, and uh, and we're really excited about uh, um, launching and getting to the space station to, to conduct our mission. Um, this is an awesome crew, and uh, so so excited to, to be a part of this <laughs> this crew with uh, Samantha Farmer and Wadi, and uh, and then also to have the opportunity. I think Samantha and I are really excited about getting to see uh, Farmer and Wadi uh, launch for the first time, and just to see how they adapt to uh, to being in weightlessness and to Sorry. to kind of yeah, <laughs> to realize this uh, this life lifelong dream. Um, we're ex excited about launching. Uh, on, a, on a U.S. rocket from Kennedy Space Center. Uh, both Samantha and I had the opportunity to launch previously. And, and so to do this from Kennedy Space Center, to have family and friends join us in that experience is really a remarkable thing. Uh, and we're excited to get to orbit and to conduct this mission, um, to conduct the science and research to improve life back here on Earth, uh, to conduct the operations to research to help us um, succeed in our mission to return to the moon and to go on to Mars and extend our presence in the solar system, to, uh, to do the maintenance and repairs uh, to ensure that we can uh, conduct safe operations on the space station, um, and really to serve uh, on a team that inspires the next generation for what is possible uh, to do when we work together as an international partnership. So we are really excited uh, to be at the end of our training flow and looking forward to our launch on, uh, on the 20th. Awesome, thank you, Chell. So we will go ahead and get started with questions here in the room on the phone and on social media. We'd love to take your questions um, on social media using the hashtag AskNASA. Um, just a reminder to those on the phone, if you would like to ask a question, please press star one on your phone or star two if your question has already been answered. Um, a reminder to folks who are asking questions to the crew, we ask that you keep it to one question for the time being so that we can make sure that we have enough time for everyone and time permitting, uh, we will circle back for some follow-ups. So let's go ahead with some questions in the room. We'll start with Mark Caro. Thank you, Mark Caro, for uh, Aviation Week and Space Technology. Um, could the appropriate ones talk about some of the spacewalk activity that's planned uh, or that you're prepared to do that could be, uh, you know, significant? 
Do you want to talk about sure. that? Sure. Uh, so uh, as it tentatively stands, obviously with everything, uh, it's all subject to change. But as it stands right now, uh, we are slated for uh, two, uh, two US EVAs. Uh, Samantha may get an opportunity to do a, a Russian EVA. Um, the US EVAs are primarily focused on uh, continuing the uh, replacement or the modernization of the uh, solar array or the power system. Uh, for the space station, uh, what we call IROSA. And so our EVAs will be what we call IROSA prep, where we're installing um, these modification kits that uh, install brackets, which the actual IROSA solar panels will go, uh, will be installed on, on future EVAs. <clears throat> All right, continuing the questions, um, let's go to Gina Sinceri from ABC News. Uh, Gina Sinceri, ABC News. Before we started, I noticed really, you guys seem to get along really well. So the, 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 the training, who wants to take this? How important is that camaraderie on a mission like this? Yeah, I can answer that. Um, it certainly is, is a big part of the kind of culmination of our training, especially. Our training kind of starts out, uh, we each kind of take on our training individually, um, or we kind of gain that foundation of skill sets on our own and then towards the end of the the, the flow um, we start to come together and really get to practice those skills and apply them together um, in real scenarios and so that has really been a joy for me and I think for all of us to really get to start to do some of that together really get to know each other spend some time together um, we even got to um, go out on a, um, a Knowles trip so that's the National Outdoor Leadership School um, and uh, do some sea kayaking out um, out in um, eastern Washington and just get to spend some time getting to know each other, understanding how we um, all function in an operational environment and, and what kind of makes each other tick. Um, and I think that's going to be really crucial on top of the, obviously, the operational side of, of what we do. Um, a big part of it is the teamwork and the uh, just the, the crew cohesion piece of being up on ISS. And I would say that's one of the most important things. You know, so NASA and our partners are really good about training us on the science, on the maintenance, and all the things that we need to accomplish. But uh, that, uh, that team spirit, uh, that crew cohesion, I think is one of the things that you can't really train. And so uh, we've had a lot of trips out to, to Hawthorne, California to train with SpaceX. And that's an opportunity when um, we, we have a chance to go out and have dinner together, uh, to train together, to bond. Uh, because that's what we carry into this mission. Uh, we get along uh, great. It is uh, uh, just such a joy to, to be with these, to have these folks um, on this team um, and to be a part of this team. And then to join the team that we have on the space station. Um, we're really looking forward to seeing uh, Sergey and Oleg and, and Dennis. Um, we had a chance to train and work with them. And that's what makes us successful, is, uh, is the teamwork and partnership. And, uh, and getting to work with a great group of folks, both on Space Station and also here on the ground. Thank you, Chelsea. Uh, we will go to Andrea Leinfelder from the Houston Chronicle. Hi, so I was hoping you could tell me um, why you chose the name Freedom for the capsule. And you know, based on the timing, I have to ask if, if it was inspired at all by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, also, if you could explain the nicknames you just kind of threw out for each other oh. as well. Thank you. <laughs> Question about names. Um, I think that, uh, you know, for the name of the vehicle, we really want to celebrate the partnership um, of, of uh, SpaceX and NASA and what commercial, the commercial crew program has, uh, has, has brought to the table. Um, they have, uh, you know, we have resumed this ability to get our crew, our astronauts um, to low Earth orbit, and I think that's very important. Um, we want to celebrate what we see as a, as a fundamental human right, and that is, uh, and then also to, to celebrate, as we kind of put out in the statement, uh, what the unfettered human spirit is capable of. Um, and as also just kind of a reflection on how far we've come. You know, uh, Alan Shepard launched on a Mercury Redstone. There's one parked out on Rocket Park as you come into to, uh, Johnson Space Center, and to see that, um, that first launch of Freedom 7 and to see where we are today uh, is really a remarkable thing. And, uh, and so we wanted to celebrate freedom for a new generation of space flyers. And nicknames, right? Oh, yeah, nicknames. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, I, I guess I'll take mine. So my uh, my call sign from the Air Force is uh, is farmer, and it has nothing to do with agriculture. Um, <laughs> the uh, I am actually named after a Russian airplane, which is the MiG-19, uh, and the NATO call sign for it is a farmer. And it's uh, it just stems. Most call signs have very little to do with something that you did well. Uh, and so uh, for me, on my first check ride in the F-15, I had a switch error where uh, I thought I had all these uh, simulated missile kills. Uh, and it turned out when we watched the tapes that I was in a guns mode the whole time. And so they named me after a Russian fighter that doesn't carry missiles. It only shoots guns. Uh, and so I'm named after the MiG-19 farmer. <laughs> so. Wadi? Uh, yeah, mine, mine's pretty straightforward. Um, you'll, you'll hear these guys calling me Wadi uh, just based on my last name is Watkins. So. Good. I think that's all the nicknames. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Right, um, so we are going to go ahead and start taking some questions from the phone bridge. A reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please press uh, star one to be added to the queue or press star two if your question has already been answered. Um, for those on the phone, please also make sure to state your name and your outlet and please um, state who your question is for. Um, so let's go ahead and take the first question from Robert Perlman with Collect Space. And Robert, if you are muted, we cannot hear you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com. Um, for the whole crew or whoever wants to take it, um, your crew patch sort of broke your tradition from the past and even future dragon crews, moving the large element from a depiction of a mythical dragon to a dragonfly. Can you share the development of the patch as a crew and if that uniqueness carries across to your personalities and approach as a, as a crew together? Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to share kind of the origination of that patch. Um, the, the dragon is such a neat concept and uh, we really appreciate the kind of the lineage of, of patches from crew one, two, and, and three, and then also demo two. Um, but I think that we wanted to reconnect with the earth in our patch and, uh, and so looked for some element that could do that. And what, uh, what better element than a namesake of a dragonfly, um, a, nat a beautiful and agile flyer, and, uh, and also you know, in many cultures a sign of good fortune. And so um, we made that the centerpiece of our patch. And, uh, and part of it also was as a uh, Kind of a call out to the launch team at Kennedy Space Center, the SpaceX team. The uh, the Dragonfly is is something of a um, I wouldn't say a good luck charm, but uh, it's something that has popped up um, before every uh, every launch out there. Remember during Demo Two, as the weather was kind of bad, a, a Dragonfly landed on on Doug's shoulder as they were getting out of the uh, the vehicles to go to the launch pad, and uh, and everybody kind of took that as a good sign. Um, I actually got to serve as an astronaut support person for Crew One's launch. I was out at the launch gantry and saw a Dragonfly land on the uh, the crew uh, the crew arm, and uh, and subsequent launches that I haven't been able to attend. Folks from the the support team has have uh, sent me photos of the Dragonfly as they as they have landed uh, in preparation for launch. So we really wanted to highlight uh, that aspect as well, and and then um, I think even better. Uh, the the uh, the patch was designed by my daughter, so uh, yeah, we were really excited about uh, the designs that she came up with. I didn't actually tell these guys uh, when I presented the art to them. I just said, "Hey, here's here's some some uh, versions of the patch," and I think we all fell in love. We we loved all of them, but really fell in love with the one that we ultimately went with, and uh, and we really appreciate the great response that the patch has had as well. I right. saw a dragonfly while we were walking in today, actually. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, nice. it's in good shape. And that's the other cool thing, is that there's something that, I mean, just like that, like yeah. as you're walking around, you see a dragonfly. It's, a it's something that just uh, warms your heart a little bit. Okay. All right. Um, we will take our next question from Marcia Dunn with the Associated Press. <clears throat> Um, for me, you're going to become the first black woman to move long term into the to, into any space station. What does it mean to you and others? Why do you think it's taken until 2022 to achieve? And Samantha, um, if you could also please talk about your take on being the lone woman in ESA's uh, astronaut corps. Thank you very much. Okay, I will start. Um, yes, yeah, so. 
you know, this is certainly um, an important milestone, I think, uh, both for our agency and, and for the country. Um, and, you know, I think it really is just a tribute to the uh, legacy of the black women astronauts that have come before me, as well as to the exciting future ahead. Um, and so I'm just uh, honored to be a small part of that legacy moving forward. Um, you know, for me, um, growing up, it was important to me to have um, role models in roles that I aspire to be in, contributing in ways I aspire to contribute. Uh, so to the extent that I'm able to do that, uh, I am I'm honored and uh, grateful for the opportunity to return the favor. Uh, but we're just super excited to uh, be a part of this crew and uh, get to execute the mission together. Yeah, and uh, from my side, um, well, that um, condition that you mentioned about me being the um, uh, only woman in the European Astronaut Corps is bound to end very soon. And uh, we are in the process of selecting a new class of astronauts. We had a huge response uh, across all uh, ESA member states. I think we got well over 20,000 solid valid applications. Uh, we are well into that process of selection now. I think we got a great response also from young uh, female professionals across the, the continent uh, compared to my selection back in 2009 where female applicants were only about 15, 16 percent. I think we're uh, about 25 percent now. Uh, and so uh, we definitely expect to, to have some, uh, some great female colleagues uh, by, the, by the end of the year, and I'm very much looking forward to that. Okay. Um, our next question comes from Paul Brinkman with Aerospace America. Uh, hi, yes, thanks for uh, taking my question. Um, I, I was wondering if uh, one of you, I guess, astronaut Lindgren, um, could you just talk about the fact that this is a, a new Dragon? Um, are you aware of any um, new features that are on this Dragon um, that, you know, may have been added? Um, and then what your, just what your training experience was like uh, training for the Dragon? Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, the training experience has been phenomenal, and uh, and I have somewhat of a unique perspective as I I kind of joined that team several years ago, almost four years ago, as the backup for Bob and Doug, and as the backup for for uh, Ike and Hopper uh, for Crew One. And so I've been working with that team, training with that team, a part of the test and development initially, and then um, really watched the training process mature over time. And so. Uh, it's been a lot of fun to go through that training formally uh, with this crew and, and to experience it firsthand. Um, in terms of new capabilities, uh, that is, I think, one of the really cool things that SpaceX uh, brings to the table is that they are constantly trying to improve and uh, to make things more efficient. Um, uh, they, I think uh, the teams that we work with are always listening to our feedback and want to make things better. and so. Um, I, the, I think that uh, a couple of things that come to mind, one, you know, just in terms of our communications uh, system within the vehicle, uh, Vox is something that uh, controls kind of the, the level of static. And, and so we have some visual indicators of, of how to set that now that just kind of take the guesswork out and, and make things, I think we, maybe we save, save a couple of minutes, but those are important minutes and, and kind of minimize some frustration. Uh, that was great. I think our favorite thing, though, is uh, that we have USB charging ports uh, in the spacecraft. Um, this is something that goes to low Earth orbit and is going to get us to the space station. And I'm talking about USB ports. But um, yeah, it's the little things. Next coffee maker. No Wi-Fi, though. Um, so, but but uh, we have tablets as a part that have some of our reference material on it. And so the ability to charge those tablets uh, just, again, takes away this idea that we have to really monitor the use of the tablet to maintain the battery charging. And, and, uh, and so those USB ports actually came, uh, were a product of the Inspiration4 mission. And so some of their private missions um, have fed capabilities into the NASA missions. And, I, and again, I think that this is a, just really demonstrates the power um, and agility of, of this commercial partnership with uh, through the commercial um, crew program and the, the benefits that feed back to NASA as a result. 
Yeah, 100% agree. I, I had the opportunity to participate in some of the verification events early on as well, not quite as early on as Chell did. Uh, but uh, to watch the vehicle evolve over time uh, and see the improvements that they uh, have brought on board, uh, especially in the human factors realm, uh, their uh, willingness to, to listen, and even if we're just kind of spitballing uh, something that could be an improvement, uh, they'll come back to us a couple months later and say, hey, we heard you say this, and this is the thing we're working on. And uh, and it's just it's been pretty amazing to to watch them and work with them and and really grow this partnership and see uh, see what we're able to do together. So it's been awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, our next question is going to come from Michelle with CBS Four News. Hi, I'm Michelle Griego with CBS Four in Denver, and I just. Um, I uh, want to congratulate all of you, but this question is for Jessica Watkins. Um, we are very excited that uh, somebody who is from Colorado is going up into space. And um, I just wanted to ask or wanted to see if you could just talk about your connection to Colorado. I know your family still lives here. And also, you touched on this historic mission and this important milestone for the agency and the country. But if you could just talk um, maybe to young girls out there who um, – are wanting to get into science and especially girls of color, how important that is and what the need is. Yes, absolutely. So yes, first of all, I'm super excited to represent Colorado with Chell as well. I attended CU. Um, but we, yes, um, my, my family, as you mentioned, lives in Boulder. Um, that's where I, I grew up, went to high school there, went to Fairview High School in Boulder. Um, and uh, Colorado has a, a pretty good showing in the astronaut corps, actually, um, with quite a bit of representation. So i um, happy to, to add my name to the list and, and try to represent you all well. Um, for your second question, um, yes, I certainly would encourage any young girls, um, young you know, children of color, young children in general, um, to to find something that you love and just pursue that relentlessly. Um, for for this job in particular, um, we're looking at the STEM fields, so science, technology, engineering, mathematics, uh, but anything within that realm. Yeah, that that's actually a, a pretty broad category um, to find something that you really love and just seek out opportunities to to do that. Um, for me, that often looked like internships. Um, I was involved in several NASA internships, kind of throughout my career before arriving here, um, and NASA does a great job investing in their internship program, and that just allows you the opportunity to get to get hands-on and get a little bit of experience um, while you're still in school and decide what it is that you really want to continue to pursue. Um, and I was really lucky to have those opportunities. So um, I would just say to, to any um, young people to, to find that thing that you love and, and continue working hard at it. Awesome. Thank you, Jessica. <clears throat> Our next question comes from uh, Chelsea Goad at space.com. Hi, thanks so much for taking my question. Uh, yes, Chelsea from space.com. Uh, you know, being crew four, you have uh, a really great and incredible group of astronauts that have come before you in flying dragons to the space station. Um, you know, whether that be you know, through these missions or through, as you mentioned, inspiration four. Have you been chatting with these other astronauts, with these former crews, and have they been giving you tips? Have you been working together? Uh, I'm curious what that collaboration has looked like in preparing for this mission. Sure. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. That is definitely uh, a very important part of uh, our training. It's not the formal training. That's the one that's like hard scheduled as classes with the instructor. But of course, it's also, as you say, very much important to learn from the experience of the crews that went before us. Uh, so when uh, Crew 2 came back, they went through a very rigorous process of debriefing their mission. And so we were always invited to participate in those debriefs. Unfortunately, we were also very busy with our own training, so we couldn't always go. Uh, but uh, we made a point of having an informal like pizza evening with, with the crew a few weeks after their return, when it was all still fresh in their mind and they could really pass on um, parts of, of that experience. A lot of it has been really how it is to, you know, the, the parts that are really a little bit more difficult to actually train in, in the formal training and the simulator. So how is it to live for a certain amount of time inside Dragon on the way to space station? How is the habitability of the vehicle? How do you actually sleep? How do you use the toilet? How do the, all those things, those practical things worked out? How about eating? How about stowage? Um, and so they, they give us um, a lot of tips. 
uh, their feedback and their, uh, you know, the, the content of their debriefs informed also uh, a process of improvement. As, as Chell was mentioning earlier, it's a very agile program. So, you know, both the SpaceX team and the NASA teams involved in Dragon, they work really hard, you know, especially because it, it's still kind of the beginning of this program, it's still the early flights, to incorporate in the next flights uh, all that feedback that they got from the previous crews. And actually, just today, we had an opportunity to have a call with uh, Crew 3, with uh, the um, guys and girls who are up there on the space station, um, just for some, you know, last minute tips from, from their side as we get ready to go into quarantine and get ready to launch in a few weeks. And then, of course, we'll have um, a lot of opportunities to um, get uh, their knowledge and expertise once we get on orbit and we have our handover period before they return. Yeah, I'd just add on to that. I think um, in the, our previous experience of training, I found that spending time around a dinner table, talking with folks that were in training or just recently returned from flight, that, that uh, I think, and many people say it, is that's where you learn space flight, is in those kind of informal conversations. Um, just asking questions and, and the, uh, the opportunity to have a, just a conversation. Um, and people have amazing stories that really drive points home. And uh, you kind of tuck, I, know, I remember I was tucking those, those little uh, pearls away uh, for, for my own flight. And so I think that that's something that, that we really try, as the Knowles expedition that, that uh, Wadi talked about, really try to find opportunities where we can gather as our own crew and then uh, gather with uh, members of the, the team that works here in Mission Control or with our uh, international partners or our commercial partners um, and then also to, to, to gather with, uh, with other crews to be able to share kind of those tips and tricks. It's really, really important. Okay, our next question comes from Russell Pounds with Pacific Rim Media. Uh, good morning and uh, greetings from Alaska. This is Russell Pounds with Pacific Rim Media. And my question is for Jessica. Uh, I wanted to hear from you about mentors today, and you spoke about internships when you were older uh, a few minutes ago, but can you recall an early story about a person who helped you discover your inner explorer and what age that first took place? Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. You know, mentors have, have always been kind of a, a force that has continued me along a pathway um, and helped me decide and determine what that pathway would be um, kind of along the way. Uh, but I think having different mentors, you know, of, of throughout your career is, has been instrumental for me in terms of getting where I am today. Um, certainly, I've, I've had lot, many teachers, um, science teachers, of course, um, at a young age in, in elementary school. And um, I remember, again, a lot of those mentorships, again, came with opportunities to be able to go out on field trips or, um, you know, go, go look at interesting things in the lab that really kind of sparked my interest and uh, kind of fueled my fire along the way. Um, I also have, have had many coaches um, along my kind of career, um, athletically as well as academically, that have also helped kind of guide me and shape me and mold me, if you will, as, as a whole human, um, which I think is a really important piece of what we do here now and also getting to, to be here is um, being able to have all aspects of yourself um, uh, be kind of diverse and um, making sure that you are involved in, in many different things so that your whole self is kind of being fed. Um, so I, those are those were definitely lessons that I've learned from mentors along the way, um, and I'm really grateful for, for all those people in my life, uh, my family and friends as well. Hi, Mom. They made a, cr they made a great human. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's one of the really cool things about uh, this, uh, you know, this career field especially, but you know, there are lots of them out there, is the opportunity to reflect on uh, how you got here. And we get asked this question a lot, and it is uh, super humbling to be able to sit in a position like this and and reflect on those kinds of things and the people that, that influenced you along the way and how many there are. There's the cast of thousands that not only take part in our training, and preparing the vehicle and all of that kind of stuff, but also going all the way back to our childhood. Like everybody that we interacted with along the way was foundational in helping us to achieve this. And that's something that I know we talk a lot about is in some way finding a way to bring all of them along on this mission with us. Uh, and so all of you watching out there are part of this. And so you are 100% part of the Crew 4 uh, team. Absolutely. 
That is awesome. <laughs> That's where your name came, your class name came from, even. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, our next question comes from David Curley with Discovery News. Thanks very much, uh, David Curley from the Discovery Channel. Uh, for the spacewalkers, can you talk a little bit about the EMUs? They're long past their uh, sell-by date. Uh, I would assume the practice suits at JSC um, might be a little bit more worn. Give us a sense of what it's like getting into one of these well-used suits. We talked about the water issue uh, in the last news conference uh, about the last spacewalk. And have any of you had anything to do with uh, XEMU uh, development? And can you tell us what you've told folks? Thank you. Uh, I'll just wow. start out and say, um, you know, when you think about the EMU, this extravehicular mobility unit, uh, it is, I think, a modern miracle of engineering. You know, when you put this, uh, this spacesuit on, it is a miniature spacecraft. You know, we have a safety tether that hooks us, up, hooks us to the space station, but everything that we need to survive, um, water, cooling, or thermal protection, uh, an atmosphere, scrubbing carbon uh, dioxide, pro the provision of oxygen at an appropriate pressure, um, all in a vehicle that is essentially molded to our bodies so that we're able to move around and do work. Um, it, is, it is incredible. And we, are, we have been asking things of this spacesuit uh, that were never really expected when it was originally designed. Um, so it's a testament to the, to the original designers, a testament to the engineers that have continued uh, its operation, and a testament to the trainers who have um, taught us how to maintain the spacesuit uh, on orbit. Uh, you know, this was originally designed that after every spacewalk, after, well, after every mission to go back down, come back down here, get refurbished, and, uh, and then sent back up. And, and we keep these spacesuits on orbit uh, to, do, to do the work up there. Um, so it, uh, you know, it has uh, definitely been um, extended past kind of its original intention, but it, it, uh, it is still uh, an amazing piece of of equipment um, that allows us to do incredible things outside of the space station. Uh, that being said, you know we are about to, to um, I guess I don't know how far we are from from XEMU becoming um, operational, Couple but years. this opportunity now to to fold in new technologies and um, and provide our our crew members with new capabilities as we return to a rocky surface um, is really extraordinary. And so you, I don't have a whole lot of experience with XEMU. Yeah, Do you? A little bit, yes. Uh, yeah. And I think that you know what you're kind of bringing up, Chell, is really important. It's this this idea of um, what we are able to do on ISS as a as a proving ground or as a, a means of you know, uh, developing technology that is going to allow us to pave the way to Moon and Mars. And I think EMU, with the transition to XEMU, is an example of that, yeah. um, to in, just to enable us to be able to do, you know, real field work um, on, a, on a rocky surface, as you say. And as a, as a geologist, that's super exciting, <laughs> the idea of being able to bend down and pick up a rock. It sounds, <laughs> sounds very trivial, but it, it is, is going to be very exciting in the science that we're going to get out thing. of that. <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, we're very excited about it. That's awesome. Okay, um, our next question comes from Zachary Aubert with the Launchpad News. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the questions. And I can just say, we love the energy of this crew. You can just feel how much of a, a family you are. So we're excited to see you guys launch. Um, Jessica and uh, Robert, with this being your first space flight, is there something specifically you're most looking forward to? We've obviously heard the zero gravity or the view from previous astronauts on their first flight, but something you're looking to. And Chell and Samantha, you guys are getting to go back after quite a while, maybe something that you've been longing to get to experience again from your first flight. And we, it's always a big question, what's the zero G indicator? You mentioned that your daughter helped design the patch. Has it already been decided and were your kids part of that decision as a crew? Classified. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, uh, zero G indicator has been decided, and it uh, will be revealed at a later date. <laughs> um, the uh, yes, this is my first flight. Uh, Wadi's as well, and uh, obviously, uh, 
I'm sure we're both really excited. I, I'm really excited. This is a boyhood dream, uh, obviously, and so that whole culmination of that is really exciting. Uh, it's uh, we kind of talked about it earlier. It's kind of surreal to be in a position like this, but to to think ahead, it's 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 really hard on a first time flight, uh, at least for me, to think beyond the things that you talked about. Like the first thing I want to do when I get up there after Seco, so, uh, you know, once that engine cuts off, I want to unstrap and go look out the window, right? Like that's the. That was part of what drove me to be a pilot. I love seeing things from a new perspective. Uh, and this is kind of the ultimate uh, part of that, is getting to look outside and see the, see the earth and see this wonderful creation that we get to live on, seeing it from a new perspective and the beauty uh, that, that, it, that it displays every day. So really looking forward to that. And then getting onto space station, uh, certainly the people part of it. You know, the more we go through training, there's all the technical aspects of everything. But as you alluded to, our crew is awesome. We've got more awesome crewmates on orbit. We've got two more classmates on orbit uh, that we get to go overlap with for a little while. And the opportunity to just go do this incredible thing with people that we, that we love is just awesome. And so we're really, really looking forward to, to spending time with everybody up there. Uh, all right. You, anyone else? What Farmer okay. said. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. I, would, I guess I would say for myself, uh, in terms of going back, um, really, really excited to, to be launching from Kennedy Space Center. You know, that uh, growing up and watching shuttle missions, being inspired by the, the images of our Apollo astronauts um, working on the moon, uh, to, to launch a mission from uh, from this historic site uh, to the ability to have friends and family just drive out to watch that launch um, and to be to experience part of um, this incredible privilege that we have of, of being part of the, the NASA and international partner team. Um, that is really exciting to me. This feels like a once in a lifetime opportunity. And so the privilege of getting to do it a second time is uh, is a little surreal. Yeah. All right, we are going to take our first question from social media before we go back to the phone bridge. A reminder, if you, if you are on the phone and you have a question, please press star one to be added to the queue or star two um, if your question has already been answered. But um, we will take our first social media question now. Uh, Natalie on Twitter would like to know um, about any pre-flight traditions that the crew has. Well, Wadi and I are first-time flyers. We don't have any traditions. <laughs> <laughs> the great thing about being a veteran flyer is that we get to make up traditions and tell them, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you like totally have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're on to us, though. I the think, rookies uh, have to get dinner for the day. <laughs> yeah. they pay, the rookies pay for everything. You didn't know that? Um, one tradition that uh, I actually had from my last mission was to launch uh, some model rockets with the family. And so I think that that's something that we'd like to do mm -hmm. as we are with our families um, at KSC getting ready uh, for our flight. Uh, just being on the beach and launching some model, ro model rockets together, I think, would, uh, is something that I think we're, we're going to do. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I, um, I'm looking forward to learning about these uh, new traditions. I mean, on my first flight, um, just like Chell, uh, we flew out of uh, Baikonur, and uh, that's a place that's really steeped in traditions. <laughs> uh, it, it's almost like being part of this uh, ritual path towards launch. Like, you know, as, as you approach launch, you just really go through those milestones that every other crew has gone through since, you know, possibly Yuri Gagarin. Um, and, 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 and I like that. I mean, it, it was, uh, I think in some ways it took the, the burden away of this uh, momentous event that was coming. You know, you, you got excited about it, but because you were going through this, all this ritual uh, steps, uh, it, it kind of felt, yeah, ritualized. You know, it, it felt like you were just repeating like something that had happened before. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so, um, you know, I, I think uh, from Canada it will be very much the same, but it's my first time launching from there. And so just like you, I'm looking forward to discovering those traditions. And I think the prior crews having, you know, worked with Bob and Doug and Ike and Hopper and some of the subsequent crews, they really felt that. They recognized that this is a historic thing that we're embarking upon, you know, launching and a new rocket. Uh, and so I think that we, they thought a lot about, hey, what are some previous traditions and do we do we borrow from those and do we borrow from our Soyuz experience too because that's very much a part of our our spaceflight experience and so I think that we've tried to introduce new traditions as we've 
gone along and yeah. And then I think we've heard that some crews have done some things and we're like, yeah, I don't think we're going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, you know, as a first time flyer, the whole, the, I mean, launching from KSC is a tradition in and of itself uh, for us. And so the opportunity to go do that is pretty amazing. I remember my first time being at the Cape and uh, going into crew quarters and I was with, the, uh, I actually wasn't an astronaut at the time. I was a, an instructor pilot and we were in crew quarters and we dropped a bunch of bags off and we ran back outside and everybody got in the rental cars. And I had this surreal moment of like, those are the, those metal doors I just walked through are the doors that the, I've seen the, watched the astronauts come out and get in the Astro van from. And I just had this moment where I'm like, somebody has to take my picture in front of this door right now. And they're like, we're hungry, get in the car. Uh, and so like just being part of that whole process of launching from the Cape and the history that is down there is just amazing. And so it's really exciting to get to be a part of that. Thank you. Um, we are going to go back to the phone br the, uh, back to the phone bridge. Uh, we'll, we will take a question from Kenneth Chang from the New York Times. Um, hello. You've all been talking about camaraderie and teamwork. Um, and I was just wondering, um, there's also this situation on the ground in Ukraine where the United States and Russia are on opposite sides. I was wondering how you approach this when you're up in space on and you, this is a situation you have no control over. Um, is this something you would, a topic you would just avoid talking about, especially with your Russian colleagues? Or would you look to have discussions and get possibly a different view? Thank you. Yeah, that's an, an important question. Uh, we are certainly not immune to the, the geopolitical situation right now. Um, these are very challenging times, um, but we are, this is our job and we've been uh, given the privilege of of this mission, going to the space station, uh, maintaining its operation, and conducting the science and research uh, that so many uh, from around the world have invested in, and, and creating that operational bridge for the programs in front of us, uh, Moon and Mars. And uh, so we take that very seriously. Uh, thousands of people have invested uh, so many hours in our training. Um, and so we very much look forward to, to getting on orbit and working with our, our Russian colleagues, uh, our friends up there, in having a safe and successful mission and getting everybody um, back home safely. So I think that uh, we will do the things that need to be done to, to make sure that we can, we can do that safely and efficiently. Uh, all the, Sergey and Dennis are amazing um, space flyers. We've had the opportunity to train with them, to, to have uh, meals with them. And, uh, and we very much look forward to, to working with them on orbit. Okay, we are gonna go back to social media. A reminder, if you have any questions for us on social media, please use the hashtag AskNASA to send those to us. Right now, I have a question from Basil Frankweiler, who is a fourth grader, and he asks, um, will you be eating the chili peppers on the station that the last crew uh, What's the shelf life What's of it? <laughs> but will, will you be eating the, the produce that is grown on the space station? Yeah, I think, I think unfortunately there are no peppers left yeah, because after taco okay. night Maybe. with uh, crew yeah, three, I think, I think, they're, they're, they're may, they maybe uh, have completed their harvest. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> will you be growing any any new plants? So there is uh, there is a uh, yep. payload up there. Um, I got to participate in that last time. Uh, it was a project called Veggie where we grew red romaine lettuce, and our crew was actually the first uh, U.S. crew to grow um, and, and eat a crop. And that is an amazing thing, to get to care for um, a plant, to, to plant it, and then to watch it grow to the size um, that it can be harvested, uh, to recognize that this could be in a really important part of future space flight as, um, as a source of food and even as a part of our environmental control system. Um, and to recognize, you know, to, to see this part, uh, a little part of what science fiction has described for a long time uh, and to be a part of that. And, that. and then to have that as, as a part of a meal was really a, a lot of fun. Um, we have, I think, kind of a, I mean, it's been seven years since I flew and so those projects have uh, continued to the point now where we're looking at different ways of growing plants and we'll be doing that. I think the project's called X-Roots. Yes. X-Roots, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, so aeroponic and hydroponic uh, strategies for growing plants. Um, I'm really excited to hear what we're going to be growing. I'm a little bummed that we missed out on the peppers, yeah. but uh, I know that you're really bummed too, Jessica. Yes, yeah. 
Um, but yeah, we're, we're excited. And so this is a really cool thing about the science that we do on station is that uh, you can see um, the, a lot of the benefits and how they help us extend our presence in the solar system and enable our future exploration and also how the, the applications that they have for the Earth. You know, uh, we recycle uh, 95, almost over 95% of our water. And we can see how that has direct benefits to, to Earth and the provision of clean water to mm -hmm. communities that don't have access to it. Um, the ability to grow uh, plants and crops, you know, without, in, without arable soil, uh, I think that we can see th those benefits as well. And, uh, and then to imagine crews someday having a whole module dedicated to to the growth of, of uh, edible plants is, is really a cool thing. And I just kind of imagine floating into that and being surrounded by green um, and, and breathing in that natural air is, is really cool, so. Absolutely. Um, we have another question from Twitter that is also about life on the space station. Uh, Karen asks how often um, station astronauts are allowed to talk to loved ones. Oh, I haven't been there yet, but I'm told. Uh, <laughs> uh, so coming out of the military, one of the things that I've identified uh, you know, in terms of, I guess, my baseline for what I know of keeping in touch with family was we would get one 15-minute phone call every week, and it was monitored, and there was somebody that would come on every five minutes and give you a countdown, and then the last minute. Uh, and uh, it is not at all like that. Um, and, and from my understanding is it's even better from when these two were up there, you know, when they had to walk uphill both ways uh, in the snow to get the station. But, um, but we have an IP phone. We're able to call our families pretty often. Uh, and then we get uh, roughly once a week uh, the opportunity to have a video conference with our families uh, back home, which I think is uh, really, really important. It's a good way to stay connected. Everybody is familiar with the different video chat uh, type technologies that are out there. And so to be able to have that and still stay, I have, I have three daughters at home, and so to be able to stay connected with them, and you know maybe they'll carry around the iPad a little bit while they're doing something. Hopefully not swimming, um, <laughs> but you know to just stay connected with the things that are going on at the house uh, is pretty special. And so it, um, I, I think it will be. I'll find it easier than uh, the military deployments that we did definitely. Yeah, we certainly get truly spoiled by the ground team here at, at JSC yeah. and, and across NASA. Um, they take really good care of us, and uh, we're super lucky to, to be a part of that team. Yeah. Okay, thanks, guys. All right, um, I think now we will take one more follow-up from the phone bridge. Uh, we will pass it to David Curley from Discovery Channel. Thank you very much for the uh, second question. Jill, this is for you. Uh, it's going to sound like a follow-on from... And Chang's question about Ukraine, but it's really not. It's it's about space culture. Christina Cook has talked a little bit about this. Can you? And secondly, did you pick the picture with the straight face in the crew photo? <laughs> Man, I have gotten so much grief yeah. from these guys. I know. You planted that question, didn't you? <laughs> of the four of us, the one person who's not smiling should not be Chell. That's the hilarious part about it. Um, I did pick that picture. I don't know. I didn't like the pictures of me smiling. So, and I asked my wife, and she's usually, I mean, she she gave me a thumbs up. So, it's the most important one. I know. I know. The, uh, yeah, my wife said that it was good. So, you guys will all have to yeah. deal with it. That's right. um, and I missed the first half of that question. The, the culture. Oh, yeah. We we get to. I mean, that that's one of the cool things about this is that that we are a part of that culture. And of course, as new um, newcomers to the station when we arrive, there is a culture that is, has been established by the team that is all, already there. And, and so, of course, we want to be good team members, and we want to respect the culture that has been, has been established. Um, for my past flight, when I arrived, uh, Scott Kelly was already on station, so he really kind of established the culture that uh, Kimia, my Japanese crewmate, and I um, came into. And it was, and it was great. You know, uh, this time around, we will be coming into, in a culture that's, into a culture that's been established by Crew 3 and our Russian crewmates. Uh, but within a few days, you know, Crew 3 will leave. And so we'll have the opportunity to make decisions about, hey, um, we really want to eat to get you know, eat lunch together, and so let's ask the ground about trying to get our schedules situated so that we can do that. Or uh, we really want to protect this time. And so I think that that we've gotten to know each other really well, and I think that uh, 
that uh, we'll make some um, decisions along the lines of what we think works best for our crew and works best um, with our uh, with our Russian colleagues as well. And we have the privilege of, of Samantha serving as our uh, USOS lead during this mission. And so I know that, um, that she's going to be talking with the ground and, and kind of advocating for a, for a lot of those things as, we're, um, as we progress through our mission. You know, cultures are malleable and changeable. And so I think that we have this unique um, opportunity to, to adjust that to make sure that we're working efficiently and, um, and having a good time while we're doing it. Thanks, Joel. Um, all right, I think we have some time for a few follow-ups here in the room, so we'll go to Mark Corot. Thank you, Mark Corot, Aviation Week. Um, in December of 2020, two of you were selected for the Artemis team, and I'm wondering uh, what this mission means to you and that prospect in the years ahead. Thank you. I think three of you were selected for Artemis. Two. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, no, no worries. Um, Yes, no, so certainly, you know, we kind of touched on how this mission and how the, the mission of the ISS overall um, really is kind of paving the way to enable um, the success of the Artemis program. Um, certainly in terms of technology, developing um, robotics and um, other technologies that will, will allow that, um, including thinking about radiation protection. Um, those are experiments that are ongoing on station to, to help solve that problem, um, as well as kind of the operational capabilities, learning um, how to work together on board, but also with the ground team, especially a ground team that might be a little bit less accessible um, than the one is currently for us um, on ISS. So that's um, an ongoing kind of question and, and something we're pursuing as well. Um, and then there's the human research aspect as well. So um, getting to do science on ourselves, on each other, um, and <laughs> learn. <laughs> yes. um, Trust me. You know, learn how the, the human body um, responds to long duration space flight um, and ways that we can help mitigate any any um, negative effects. Um, so thinking about exercise, for example, we've, mm. we've made huge gains in terms of reducing bone loss when we return from Earth, uh, return to Earth, those types of things. So I think all of those kind of incremental, inter incremental progress that we have made over the course of ISS and that we'll contribute to during our mission uh, will really enable us to be successful in Artemis. And what, I mean, what an amazing time to be a part of NASA. Like we, I feel like we won the lottery. We, uh, we have a program, I mean, we have Artemis and we have Orion and we have a human landing system programs that are that are figuring out ways to get our astronauts um, and our partners to the moon and, and landing on the moon and, and with Mars in our sights. Um, you know, there, I think there's, there's kind of a running joke that Mars is always 30 years away. And I have felt that horizon shrink um, considerably. And, uh, and so that is incredibly exciting. I mean, we have uh, served as an infrastructure for a commercial program, and now we have I mean, it just seems like there are rock, <laughs> rocket companies launching yeah. uh, every week and uh, a robust program to get cargo to the space station. Uh, and, and all these commercial companies that are vying to be a part of our return to the moon. Yeah. Uh, so it's an extraordinary time to be here. Um, it's so exciting to see all the, the activity um, that's going on. And, and now to, to get to go to the space station and really be the eyes and hands uh, for the team that is figuring these things out, figuring out this path and the technologies that are required to go to get back to the moon and to go on to Mars is is really extraordinary. Yeah, the um, you know historically you look at it and we were a very uh, we were a strand of things, right? Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, Apollo, uh, Apollo, Soyuz, and then shuttle. And now it's, it's a like, web, yeah. right? Like it is a web. The uh, space industry is just incredible. Uh, and you know, as NASA pivots to the moon and Mars, uh, that pivot point is space station. All right, so all that yeah. technology is going to space station where we develop it and refine it before we pivot and send it off to the moon and then eventually to Mars. So it's, uh, it's an incredible time to be here. Awesome. Uh, that, that will all be illustrated uh, quite profoundly when we get to watch Artemis 1 launch yeah. from, from on board. Yeah. So, so yeah. you guys can put in a plug so that our, you know, it just works out that we're over yeah. Florida somewhere yeah, when an Artemis launches, yep. that would be awesome. Yeah. I'd like that shot. That would be <laughs> so amazing. Would yeah. That would be amazing. That was one of the coolest things actually during my last mission. Um, our uh, pointing folks and, and 
um, the folks that are kind of tracking our, our orbital path would send up notes saying, hey, we have a Soyuz launch or, or a Progress launch or a Cygnus launch. If you look out this window at this time, you should be able to see it. And I never really thought that that was possible, that you could actually see those launches. And yet one night, so um, we knew that there was a Progress launch. It was dark over Kazakhstan. We all got into the cupola together and we're watching the ground. And I mean, sure enough, we, we saw a little dot kind of where we thought Baikonur would be. And then we saw that, that light blossom. And then we saw that light climb into, climb off the ground and you could see the illumination from the rocket um, below it. And it just absolutely blew my mind that we could see that with our, with our own eyes. Yeah. And then just watch that dot climb up and, and we had passed over the top at that time and watch, watch it climb up uh, through the horizon. Um, that, was, that was profound. And so if we get to see Artemis do that, that would be Pretty amazing. Epic. Yeah. Can't wait for you guys to come back with more of those stories. <laughs> yeah. Here. All right, we have time for one more question from Gina Sinceri at ABC News. Uh, this is for Samantha. Um, you're going on a spacewalk. Will you wear a U.S. suit, a Russian suit? And if I remember correctly, your gloves were on the Cygnus that blew up. Did they ever replace your spacewalking gloves, and who did? Uh, so there's a little bit of conflation of, of aspects there. Uh, so I have now trained in the EMU on uh, this training floor. I have only trained in the um, Russian uh, spacewalking suit. It's called Orlan. Uh, the gloves are not mine, like for life. They were like my gloves back then, but then they've been used by other crew members. I, I actually know for a fact that Anne McLean has used those gloves, which was kind of excited. <laughs> um, we, we are like uh, glove twins, I guess, or, or hand twins. Uh, but maybe other crew members have. I mean, they're definitely not like my gloves. Um, but yeah, so but this on, on this specific flight, if I get to do a spacewalk, which was. 100% not sure, then it would, uh, it could only be a, um, a spacewalk in the Russian or land suit. Which is pretty amazing. That, I mean, that she is, she is trained in the U.S. system with the, the REMU and is now trained and, and certified to fly the Orlan system um, is, is an amazing thing. Not many so people cool. that are dual qualified. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Okay, folks, that's going to be all the time that we have for today. Um, thank you to the Crew 4 for joining us today. Thank you to everyone in the room, on the phone, and on social mm -hmm. media who s sent us your questions. Please make sure to tune in to watch these astronauts launch on the Crew Dragon Freedom from Kennedy Space Center to the International Space Station on April 20th. You can tune in on NASA.gov, the NASA TV app, um, as well as uh, all of the NASA, uh, NASA social media channels. That's going to conclude today's press conference. Thank you and have a wonderful day. There it is, orange soil. Well, don't move it till I see it. Hey, it is. I can see it from here. It's